Okay. Well, thank you very much to everyone listening uh, and welcome to Harassis. This is a session on technology and the public good. My name is Ravi Chidambra. Uh, I'm the president and co-founder of TC Capital, which is an investment firm based in Singapore. Uh, I'm the moderator for this session. We have some very, very distinguished panelists that I will very briefly introduce and have themselves then uh, inter introduce themselves. Let me start with Elizabeth Rossiello, who's the CEO uh, of Aza Finance. Uh, we then have uh, Rufus Lidman, who is the founder uh, of AIDR uh, EdTech. He's based in Sweden. We have uh, Tadahiro Kawada, who is the founder of Kawada Technologies. Uh, we also have, uh, he's calling in from Tokyo. Uh, we have Bernard Moon uh, from Spark Labs. He's the founder of Spark Labs, and he's based in Palo Alto. Uh, and we have Tom Hassan, who's based in Brussels and is the managing partner uh, of Humane NV. So uh, let me have each of the panelists introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll jump into our topics for today. Great. Uh, Thanks yeah, so much. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Thanks so much, Ravi. And it's great to be on a panel with everybody this morning. I'm here in London, but I started as a finance in Nairobi, Kenya, eight years ago. We are Africa's largest non-bank FX broker. We provide all of the FX, treasury, settlement, and payment infrastructure for the growing sector of financial institutions, fintechs, and SMEs that are booming across the continent. We are based between three continents with offices in the UK, Europe, Mideast, and all across Africa. And we're a proud, a very diverse company with 50% females all the way from the top to the bottom. And we focus on really lowering the cost and the friction of doing business across the continent of Africa and in adjacent frontier markets. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Rufus? Yes. Hello, Rufus. Nice to be here. Nice to meet you, Ravi, and all of you others. Uh, honored to be here in this fantastic subject. Uh, my background is, is uh, with degrees in business and statistics, uh, PhD studies, and uh, a lot of data science. I've been a digital strategist for for uh, for uh, more than hundred companies uh, like Samsung, etc., all on three three continents. Uh, they call me a tech influencer sometimes. I have fifty thousand followers. I have three hundred lectures. I publish four books, and I have an app. Uh, I've, uh, I launched the biggest app in the world within digital strategy, loved by 200,000 people in 165 countries. Uh, but really, I'm, I'm, I'm more, more a digital entrepreneur. I've run more than, a, more than half a dozen ventures, and uh, uh, so both, both in, in Europe and in Asia. And uh, some winners of, of growth, uh, growth prizes, and uh, with 50 million downloads, apps with 50 million downloads. And, and um, yeah, uh, two, three, okay exits. Um, the, the most recent, like Ravi said, uh, well, is IR, uh, EdTech, uh, be, being uh, positioned in, in Singapore uh, for the Asian market doing a game-changing um, EdTech technology for, 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 for the needy uh, in, in uh, emerging markets. That's Thanks, about Rufus. it. Tadahiro? Hi, I'm Tadahiro Kawara. I'm calling in from Tokyo. Uh, my company is called Kawara Technologies. I am the founder of Kawara Technologies, but I'm a fourth generation uh, president of a Kawara group. And we do big steel structure. If you have been to Tokyo, you see uh, my our products, uh, bridges, high rises, uh, dome stadiums. Uh, those uh, steel structures are a lot of it from my, my company. We also have a... a uh, aviation services, uh, IT, and IoT um, services, environmental and su sustainabil sustainability uh, services, and also uh, robotics. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Tadahiro. Bernard? Hi, I'm, I'm Bernard Moon. I'm a co-founder and a partner at Spark Labs Group. We're a relatively young uh, venture capital firm that invests in uh, seed and series a we've invested in over 300 startups across six six continents since uh 2013 and just happy to be here thank you bernard especially for staying up so late we appreciate <laughs> it yeah tom 
Hey everyone, uh, my name is Tom. Uh, I'm happy and humbled to be here. Um, I'm, I think I'm the Benjamin of the group with 24 years old. Uh, but I um, run a company, well, actually, well, two big ventures. So at one point, I decided, like, what am I going to do with my life? And I wrote down, I want to impact a billion people's lives positively. Started thinking about how I could start doing that. Uh, and that birthed, well, two, the two big projects that I'm running in, in my life right now. The first is Humane. Um, with Humane, the idea or, or the, the, what we're doing is we're helping companies um, design uh, intelligent automation strategies that are aimed at, uh, you know, really um, empowering people. So our, our main idea there is that 70% of the success of these intelligent automation strategies depend on people and processes. So we want to um, want to help them, you know, uh, get get the most out of their jobs by automating away all the boring tasks and, and the non-value, non-purpose um, tasks. So we're currently doing that with uh, a, a couple of multinationals. And uh, we're also doing that for the European institutions. I am um, I help them set up uh, uh, an, in, an innovation hub, so an interinstitutional innovation hub with the European institutions. And then the second part of it is uh, what I call the Impact Billionaires. The Impact Billionaires is a community where we uh, work on big ideas and, and, and ask big questions and bring together uh, impact entrepreneurs. Um, and we're working on things like, for example, what would it take to provide the world with free food? Uh, one of the projects that we're uh, running is an AI farm. And basically the idea that we have uh, exponential technologies, uh, you know, having in price every, every, every year for a certain performance. And so our idea there is that if we can, you know, fix the problem of, of, of the entire food uh, supply chain in the sense of that there's no human interaction needed, we could arrive at free food eventually uh, in, 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 in 10 years. So that's one of the, issues, one of the things that we're tackling uh, there as well. So that gives a bit of an idea of the two things uh, that I'm doing to achieve that goal of impacting a billion people less positively. Great. Thanks, Tom. So for the benefit of everyone listening in on the session, uh, we're going to cover four topics around technology and the public good today. Uh, I will ask some of the panelists uh, to speak on each of the issues. And when we're done, um, we're happy to spend the last few minutes taking questions from all of you. So let's get started. Uh, our first topic today is how technology is completely transforming public good outcomes in emerging markets. And I would like Elizabeth and Bernard actually to weigh in on this interesting topic. I'll start with Elizabeth. Thanks so much. Well, when I arrived in Kenya in 2009, it was the start of fast internet available in East Africa. And in, in just a few years, we saw the rise of an entire class of young, uh, ambitious, educated entrepreneurs arise and, and really make an example for the rest of the continent on what was possible with access to technology. And it was a few private founders that created tech hubs, as we called it, or iHubs across, across the country and the city. The government was involved as well, bringing in that high-speed internet. And it was really uh, a change a change point for the whole continent. It showed what was possible. And then when you think about Nigeria and Ghana, which followed suit in just a year or two later, we saw those ecosystems leapfrog Kenyan and East African in, in ecosystems because they had already had an example of what was possible. And you saw both public and private investment, not just in internet, but in also in availability of education, um, access to finance, um, government programs, donor, donors, etc. It was really a merging of the two. And now we're at a place where the private sector has come to take over in a lot of ways that the government is not able to support in some ways. So while technology has, you know, in the first part as a public good and a public infrastructure, we do see limitations in frontier markets for the public sector to keep pace with the speed of innovation and the speed of adoption of technology. And I think the African continent and all of its 55 countries in very different regions has a lot of case studies on how that, that happened. And one point that I like to share is that Y Combinator is graduating Nigerian fintechs every cohort. And we just had our sixth unicorn on the continent in the fintech sector after 15 years of none. And that was all in the last basically year. So I think we've just seen a huge potential for the African continent and other frontier um, regions for using technology, not just for the private sector, but for the public sector. A lot of the startups and growth stage companies, um, I feel like almost a senior citizen as an eight-year-old technology company on the continent. 
continent are solving social problems. They're solving access to finance. They're solving access to education, um, identification, um, um, you know, e-learning in remote areas. I mean, it's really exciting to see what can happen with all the potential, something as simple as the internet, but also now going forward with um, APIs and open banking and um, really a free education system that's complementing all of that. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's great. Uh, Bernard, I know you've been an active investor across many continents, including emerging markets. Tell us some of the things you've invested in, how you see tech sort of transforming public good outcomes in these places. Yeah, I, I mean, technology has always been, I think, an equalizer, right? And as definitely the world gets flatter um, and you see entrepreneurship just growing, you know, throughout the world and throughout uh, various emerging markets. I mean, we invested in at the seed stage of a company called Andela that was started by Jeremy Johnson and some people. Um, and their initial base was Nigeria. So the thesis behind Andela was that the top uh, software developers could be uh, from anywhere in the world. So basically, they developed a program to test and train this top uh, 1% of software developers starting in Nigeria. And they've expanded into East Africa, Kenya, and uh, they are projected recently uh, by Fortune of being uh, one of the next unicorns. So we've seen definitely um, just uh, impact and scale throughout uh, not just Africa, but Southeast Asia and other emerging markets. So, Yeah, great. Before we move on to the next topic, uh, if any of the other panelists want to weigh in, uh, you're welcome to. Very good. Then let's move on to the next topic. The next topic is about how technology is impacting sustainability around the world. You know, so just like it's transforming emerging markets in terms of public good outcomes, how is it happening in one of the biggest public policy debates right now, sustainability? I'm going to start with Tadahiro. Tadahiro, I know that you've spent a lot of time uh, working in Japan on various uh, projects uh, and I want to get your views. Uh, you're on mute, Tadahiro. I'm sorry. Yes, well, well traditionally, uh, the public good uh, uh, infrastructure uh, or ro making roads and uh, uh, dams and uh, all the infrastructure that uh, now, now we have and uh, um, but but uh, uh, now uh, a Japanese government has has uh, committed for the uh, um, uh, uh, carbon zero by uh, 2000, uh, 2050 um, so uh, suddenly uh, many many companies in Japan are, uh, are trying to uh, reduce the uh, um, uh, carbon footprint uh, um, and and uh, um, environmental impact. Uh, so um, even, our company has been investing also on the uh, uh, things of the uh, how, how to reduce uh, uh, CO2. Um, and uh, we, we have, we well, we buy a lot of steel from uh, uh, steel making companies like Nippon Steel. And, and they said that they're going to, to, to completely switch their uh, um, 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 steel making from burning coal to uh, uh, change to hydrogen and, and whatnot. So I think uh, sustainable is uh, uh, definitely uh, something that we have to do. I mean, we see climate change here really bad. Um, we, we get we're getting more violent uh, uh, rains and uh, uh, temperatures are rising. So uh, uh, definitely, um, whatever we do in the public sector or private sector, uh, sustainability is, is very, very important. Very good. Tom, I know that your startup um, tries to tackle various sustainability challenges. Can you share with us uh, what you've been doing and how you see tech as a force for good in this area? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think I want to I wanna talk about a bit of, on a conceptual level first in the sense of I think the, what the power that technology brings is we can either look at it in, from an innovation standpoint, which is kind of um, optimizing a current paradigm, but we can also look at it from a, from a 
disruption standpoint, in the sense of we are completely shifting the paradigm. And I feel like the technologies that have been taking the world by storm in the last 30, 40 years have really been accelerating those possible paradigm shifts in a, in a, in a, in a way. And so to make that a, a bit more concrete, how I think that's super relevant and super interesting is take, for example, the AI farm that we're working on with the Impact Billionaires. Um, the idea, the concept there is that we are using um, an exponential technology, meaning or a set of exponential technologies, there's AI, there's solar, um, there is robotics, there is uh, 3D printing. And we're figuring out a way to combine all of these so we can completely remove human interactions within that com complete uh, sphere. Why are we doing that? Because... Again, an exponential technology means that every X amount of time, the price performance drops, uh, which means that you pay half the price for the same performance in X amount of time. Um, so if we can solve issues like, for example, that AI farm today, and we can completely close that loop entirely from the moment you germ, like, you know, put the seed in the ground all the way to your plate, all of a sudden we don't, we wouldn't need to pay for food anymore. Like there's no need to, uh, you know, go to work to put food on the table. And so all of a sudden, that allows us to live in a completely different paradigm in the sense of today, the economy really works on a lot of people not being, uh, you know, having to go to work again to put, put that food on the table, um, not necessarily being able to even think, you know, if, you, if your next worry is worrying about your meal, you're not going to care about, you know, what's happening to the planet or, or, or less, at least less. There's still people I don't want to like generalize. And so I think the power of technolo technology lies in exactly the shifting of those paradigms, because I, I think today we have uh, a system that is producing a suboptimal outcome. And I think, you know, the, 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 the main system that is doing that um, is, is, you know, capitalism as we know it. I, I, I think it is brilliant incentive structure uh, in the sense that it really has, you know, provided a lot of that innovation. Um, but what I would love to see or what I think technology can mean a lot on that conceptual level is we can create a system where we have, you know, an idea like that of the donut economic model where you have a social floor and an ecological uh, boundary. We can do that in a way where it doesn't have to, um, you know, have a negative impact on certain parts of the population. And um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I'll just get a final word in from Bernard. I know that you've invested in a lot of sustainability companies. I would be curious, uh, sustainability tech companies. So I'd be curious to get your thoughts, Bernard. Yeah, I mean, um, definitely there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are focusing on this um, area of sustainability and tackling it in different ways, whether it's uh, with specific problems or uh, empowering entities or corporations to tackle various sustainability challenges. Um, I mean, we've seen it from obviously everyone knows of Beyond, uh, Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, right? Tackling uh, carbon emissions uh, from that angle. And, uh, you know, we've also invested in a company uh, called Labico. So they deal with uh, the problems that fast fashion creates, which I'm sure Many people know that fast fashion is one of the most um, uh, greatest producers of waste in the world, right? I, I believe it's like... It accounts for 9% of global emissions, FYI. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, some studies, it ranges from 4% to 10%, right? And it... will take the high end. Yeah, you'll take the high end then, the 10%. And then uh, each year produces like, I think, over 90 million tons of waste 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 and also like i think it's over 70 trillion uh uh liters of uh wastewater too right so it's it just a huge you know uh dent on the ecosystem so we invest in a company called labico which is a so uh it's a circular fashion platform that promotes sustainability they work directly with consumers in terms of creating this circular economy but also they also provide their platform to various uh, uh, fashion brands throughout the world uh, to also combat this. And then, you know, there's also uh, direct plays in ag tech that we've invested in, whether it's on the other side of the 
uh, carbon emissions problem with uh, cows and uh, other uh, livestock, where uh, we invested in a company that uh, created a, a method where methane is decreased in cows by uh, giving them seaweed, right? So they eat the seaweed, and then it, it actually becomes actually uh, carbon negative. That, that's the, what the recent research has shown. So that's sort of interesting, too. But anyways, I'll, I'll open up the floor to others to speak. No, those are great examples, and and thank you for that, Bernard. Um, moving along to the third topic, you know, this so, is sorry, Ravi. Can, can sorry, I jump Rufus, in I was going to call you in on the third one, but please go no, ahead. No, let let me jump in on this one. This is so so important. Uh, that's a that's a matter of, of life and death uh, for us, if not for us, for for our children. No. Uh, so, so, but it is fun when when you start battling about this uh, percentage. Is it nine percent or four or ten percent, etc.? And I think that's that's where uh, that's where everything uh, goes down to. Because uh, today uh, we don't know what the carbon footprint is for the consumers, uh, and who has the power today? Ah, that's the next question. Who has the power today? For me, the power is in the in the, in the companies, and the companies uh, the. What 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 uh, what are the companies dependent on? They're dependent on consumers. So, uh, what if we had had uh, like, like we have like the nutrition we have on all the food? What if we have a, a tag with with the, the carbon footprint on exactly everything that we have uh, that we consume, uh, whether it's products or services? What if we we don't wait for the politicians to do this because they will they will do this, but it will take ten or fifteen years. And then it's too late. Uh, then it will, will, will be more than 1.5 1, 1. Uh, 1. Uh, global warmth anyhow. What if uh, we as, as uh, companies uh, will, will demand from our suppliers, uh, the suppliers like Tadahiro or, or, or anyone, that, that we need the LCA and a life cycle analysis with the carbon footprint on everything that, 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 we, that we want? Uh, and make that, uh, it, don't wait, wait, we make that uh, something that together with this fantastic new generation of Greta and these two third in the world that right now that think that uh, the climate crisis is, is a global emergency. It was not like that a couple of years ago, but now it's two third. What if we together with these two third uh, of, of the global population can make this uh, something that is social credibility is uh, how many, how much climate tracks uh, that, that you do in your consumption, I think everything lies in there. What what is what is not measured is isn't. Uh, we we I don't know if this is a Swedish saga, but monsters in, in the sagas in in the, in the stories of we tell the children, monsters are in dark woods, okay. And the only way to kill the monsters are to bring them out in the sun. That right now the carbon footprint is in the dark uh, in the dark woods. Let's bring it out in the sun and let's kill it. Yeah, no, it's a very strong point. Yep, absolutely, Rufus. Um, we are running out of time a little bit, so let me move on to the third or fourth topics. Hopefully, we'll get to the fourth, but if not, we'll, we'll stop with three. Um, and this is a really interesting uh, point of debate, and that is do we live in the age of COVID, and it has sort of transformed the role of the public sector and governments. You know, they've come more into prominence after a long period of sort of receding into the background. And, you know, there's been a, quite a mixed response around the world in terms of government performance on this. Technology is a major part of addressing COVID, of course. And then it sort of begs the question, as we seek better public goods, you know, globally, uh, is the private sector better suited to provide that, in your view? Uh, or, you know, is there now a newly prominent role for governments to play again? So let me start with uh, Elizabeth. I know you have some interesting views on this, so we'd love to hear about it. Sure. I mean, um, there's a lot of work to be done in a lot of frontier markets. There's so many things to focus on. There's vaccine distribution. There's uh, universal health care. There's basic infrastructure. It's an impossible task to be everywhere at once. And these are young governments of 50, 60, 70 years old, um, still getting their grips on, on how to tackle it, all these challenges. So, you know, and, and many are still in, um, in unfair colonial kind of relationships with other governments. So um, there's no other way with the speed of innovation occurring right now and, and the need and the demand of the growing population um, we have to work with the private sector. And in fact, the private sector is not asking for permission 
it's just going forward. And um, we've seen that everywhere, even in countries with a very strong grip um, on government services, such as Senegal or Morocco. Um, Ethiopia has opened up in a big way in, in the last year. So even where the government is very strong and doing a great job, you still see the private sector coming in in a big way. And, you know, we had a, a period of time where there was government private sector partnerships, specifically with the telecoms across Africa. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of how that's worked out. It's definitely, you know, introduced innovation in some ways early on in 2007, but then completely blocked in an oligopic way, all other innovators from coming in the space. So we definitely don't want to see that happen. And that does happen as a pattern in frontier markets as they figure their way forward. Um, what's been very exciting is the entrepreneurial movement and the revolution across the continent. And I wouldn't say that it's new. Um, entrepreneurs have existed from the beginning of time, but I think now they have technology, they have access to global finance, they have access to global education. They can take a microcredit course from Harvard for free. They can um, get, get funding and crowdfunding from Mongolia and they're living in Togo. And they're able to kind of connect with similar like-minded people over the internet using open source software in a way that was never before. It's democratizing. And it really shows that we don't need to wait for a government if the government's not ready or they're preoccupied with something else. And I think what we need to figure out now is how do we regulate or how do we work with governments? Because now we're going to have this completely diverging system where one sector is moving at warp speed and the other is kind of catching up. And we have that right now with financial regulation. We've seen some governments on the continent of Africa um, implement incredible financial regulation and, and others not at all. And um, it's it's really interesting to see who's devoted time and resources. And I think for governments to catch up and, and keep pace, they need to invest in the same way that the private sector is investing. And we haven't seen that on a wide scale yet. We've seen governments invest in agriculture, in infrastructure, in healthcare, in education, but not in technology in the way that needs to happen. And you know, similarly, it's it's a, it's a similar story of incumbents in the in the private sector. We've seen Fortune fifty Fortune hundred companies maybe not always invest in technology at the speed they need to. And we've seen also in the private sector a divergence of players that have invested heavily in technology and players that have not. Um, and I think it's the same in the public-private sphere. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really interesting viewpoint, Elizabeth. Thanks for that. Um, you know, does anyone playing devil's advocate, does, do any of the panelists have a different view that government also has a prominent role to play? in using tech to deliver public good. Tadahiro. Yes, um, of course, of course uh, um, what, what Elizabeth said is very, very valid. But uh, um, what time like this, uh, all the vaccinations and uh, all the stuff that are helping out the private sector with the, with the uh, incentives to be closed, the store, I mean, that government has to do such a thing. And in my country, uh, our, our government's not doing such a good job, I think, I think but uh, 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 c countries like uh, uh, like uh, 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 Taiwan, well, it's, it's coming up now, we'll cut Taiwan, and uh, um, New Zealand, places like that, they, they did a really good job with uh, uh, not letting all the uh, co companies go broke by, by injecting money. I think that that's the type of thing that the government should be doing. Mm. Yeah, if I could just... Rufus Bernard, go ahead. Well, I, I think the post-mortem analysis will be interesting, right? Sort of seeing how different um, governments reacted and policies in, in sort of different subsectors. I mean, just because, you know, I'm in the U.S., but we have operations throughout Asia, especially in Korea and Taiwan. So it was interesting to see how um, our teams were interacting there, right? And let's say you look at the U.S. and um, I would say it's failure across the board, right, uh, in some ways, right? You look at when Trump was in leadership, like, you you know, he totally underreacted, right? But then also even at the state and local level, I think there was sort of a, a failure to uh, react uh in the best way possible, right? And policymakers in the US, they would cite, it was interesting because they would cite, oh, Korea, they have advanced contact tracing, they have advanced mobile apps, that's why they never shut down retail and restaurants, et cetera. 
And then we see in Taiwan, which of course they, it was different because they shut down the borders early from China, but their contact tracing, which a lot of people in the U.S. didn't know, was paper. Any meeting with three or more people, they had paper contact tracing, and that's how they're able to sort of go about business as usual. So it's not always just technology, but it's actually the willingness of the government to keep things going. So the postmortem will be interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you, that, that's, uh, you, you're totally right. And now it's a time that politicians should go in. It's, it's when you have a crisis, so of course. But on the other hand, what would, what would this crisis have been uh, if, if we didn't have, if we didn't have uh, online working, online education, online, all, all the things that, that was coming, online banking, online uh, gro grocery, etc. And all, none of that, this comes from, from, from a politician. So I think the, the, it would be been a much more bumpy road if we didn't have the digital giants that supported us with, with the, the technology that is needed to make this crisis a very uh, a tragical crisis for, for, for the pandemic, but, but an economical crisis that w would have been a disaster without this. So it's, of course, it's a combination. Yeah. Tom, go ahead. <laughs> Two seconds. I think I think there we've we've talked about like the empowering, for example, of, of digital. But I do want to, like if I remember correctly, the internet started with DARPA, which is a government funded program. So I think the role of government like it's unfair to want the government to be an entrepreneur. I think the roles are completely different. Sure, most of the value is delivered through true entrepreneurship, absolutely. And we need to empower them, but we need to guide them. And I think there are clearly different views and different ways of looking at it and different, um, how do I call it, like responsibilities. And so if, like, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the, the, the donut economics model that really provides a clear division of responsibilities within that because you, do want, you don't want to stifle innovation, but also what companies are investing in basic research, like None are like there's very few companies that have the resources and want to take the risk of investing in basic research with things like, for example, uh, DARPA and, and those things. So I think in that sense, yes, they're, they're, you know, handling crises and all these things. There are ways to to create a digital infrastructure that is a lot more sophisticated and that is a lot better at handling, you know, those those issues and guiding uh, uh, things, but I think it's unfair to to expect the government to be an entrepreneur because I think what you get if you want the business like if you want the government to be run like a business, then you get things like a Donald Trump, for example, that you know focuses on you know we, in my opinion uh, not necessarily um, you know a, a great environment for entrepreneurship for all people. Maybe there, it's the more privileged that get the entrepreneurship. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with you, and I think most people would agree. It's not, uh, there's obviously clear roles, right? No one's saying that we expected government to deliver groceries online and everything else, right? It's just more like, you know, providing the right sort of policy framework so things do run efficiently, right? And making the best decisions, not political ones, right? Political ones. <laughs> Yeah, I think the irony in this whole debate is we talk about public good. And, you know, historically, public good has been a concept that governments deliver public good. You know, but with the tech revolution, a lot of governments have been sort of left behind uh, through a combination of bad governance uh, and tech. You know, they've sort of been uh, preempted by the private sector. So I think that's sort of the interesting dynamic in this debate. And to Elizabeth's point, in places like Africa, where, you know, governance was probably, you know, not always the strongest consistently across the continent, uh, the private sector effectively has filled that vacuum, you know, from what I'm hearing. So, um, you know, those are the interesting debates. And that sort of takes us into our final topic, which is also interesting. Given the power of tech, and now also the fact that governments are getting their hands on a lot of this tech, right? You know, as well as say, maybe more unscrupulous private entrepreneurs, you know, getting their hands on tech, you know, could we have a scenario where the technology that we want to deliver public good, you know, is somehow twisted and, you know, you end up with uh, surveillance of citizens, uh, you know, data privacy breaches, 
and, you know, various other dystopian sorts of scenario perpetuated either by governments or, you know, uh, by by private sector companies. So let me open that up as a final topic uh, to the, uh, the panelists. Well, I think this is a delicate question, and I actually don't have the answer, but, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, on the one hand, from a humanistic point of view, this is absolutely right. This is 1984, and we're, we're getting there. We're there already with, when it comes to surveillance, etc. cetera. On, on the other hand, uh, Europe, Europe do, giving the, the most robust GDPR uh, 10, 10 years too late, uh, crippling themselves uh, and making, making the, the companies uh, toothless, uh, compared to APAC, uh, where we have, uh, in most most countries, have have much more uh, better access to to data for 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 drilling our artificial intelligence and making it uh, the, the world champions when it comes to AI. So, so uh, it's it's really really a delicate twist, question when it comes to in- individual integrity compared to competitive advantage as nations and, and continents, etc. Yeah, I think the question here is in the name of public good, delivering yeah. public good, you know, mm-hmm. can that somehow be undermined, right? You know, are there unwitting consequences? If I can just, I think it starts with the question of what is public good? Because I feel like, for example, in China versus the US, what public good means is, is completely different. In China, you probably have a more... Uh, you know, you know, more, more common mentality and like what is good for the group is good for every, while in the US, you, you know, very likely have a more individualist, uh, perspective on those things. And I think that translates, like, uh, Rufus said as well, very well in, in the different AI strategies that you see. Um, and in that sense, yes, sure, I agree. GDPR does make, um, make, you know, a level of, of toothlessness. But then if we look at what the public good means in the end, what happens? You know, when it comes to surveillance, for example, you know, in China, they are doing it for, you know, the public good as such. But in the U.S., the same thing, you know, you have a Facebook that is completely surveilling you, that is, you know, selling your data and influencing the way you think and work also for that same idea. of You know, we're entrepreneuring where, you know, this is the public good. So you end up with two um, of the almost same outcomes in the sense of like you are not necessarily as free as you think you are. And then and, you know, if freedom, for example, is in my mind, is one of the highest public goods. Um, and then you have Europe that is trying to, to be kind of a kind of moral compass of the world, trying to, to, to protect. So I think, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, I'm, I, don't, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure that those two extremes are going to have the best publicly good outcomes. Um, I, I guess time will tell, but I, I think it starts with that question of what is public good in its own context? Because, you know, I, for example, say that freedom is, is one of the highest public goods, but maybe in other parts of the world, they think about that in a completely different way. Um, so, yeah, that makes it even more tricky, I think. Other okay. viewpoints? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think as certain technologies develop, um, you know, regardless of the fr- framework that... Uh, Tom laid out like AI, right? I really do think as AI advances, um, it, it could be sort of a slippery, slippery slope where people in power could use it as sort of a, a, a an excuse or justification for decisions, right? Where you could see even like military actions be punted to an AI framework, right? And saying, oh, it wasn't our decision, you know, you know, it, it was a drones based on the AI system. That's why they shot like, you know, a hundred people within this area, right? So it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens the next, you know, ten to thirty years. So. Any closing thoughts, Elizabeth Tadahiro, on this topic? I think that um, technology won't wait for anyone, and um, the the beauty of technology, and specifically open source technology, is that it can't be contained. Um, and I know that makes a lot of people very scary, but it can also work for the public good. And um, we've seen great, great examples of that. And um, it's almost impossible for someone in their 40s or 50s to to learn at the speed of somebody in their teens or 20s. And and these are these, this is the population and the demographic that has control over the technology right now. And it's a completely step change in what we've known. And um, if you look at countries like Nigeria, which will be the 
fourth most populated country in the world in the next 20 years and the demographics are younger and younger, we have to see that the power of technology follows the power of demo demographics and, and, and the youth. And that's going to be very different. And it's going to change how decisions are made. It's going to change how governments look and the role of government. And I think we just have to have faith and hope that um, this next generation uses the technology and their knowledge for the public good. Yeah, try to hear. I, I completely echo that. But uh, and you know, look, look what we're doing now. I mean, uh, Elizabeth, you're in Nairobi, and I'm in Tokyo, and you know, all you guys are all over the place. And here we are talking about this great stuff. But then again, if we if I say something bad about some other country, I might be get in trouble because some AI might be surveilling this. So um, it's good and bad. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, that sort of wraps up uh, the session. Uh, I will see, uh, do any of the, um, the other people uh, have any questions? Uh, happy to, uh, if you type in your questions, happy to put it to the panelists. Looks like okay. Everybody's any typing. any questions from the audience? Okay. Well, maybe then in the remaining one or two minutes, uh, you know, I will ask for any closing thoughts on the subject uh, from the panelists. Well, the drawing on, on the on the last thing that you were talking about uh, with technology. Uh, it, we will not be able to stop it, and it, it's it's a matter of. And you were talking, Bernard, about AI being being a slippery slope. Uh, technology does not have any value in itself. Uh, technology is totally neutral. Uh, it's like a hammer. You can build, a, you can kill someone with a hammer, or you can build a, a hospital or, or, or a university with this hammer. Uh, so it depends on all what we intend to do with this this uh, technology. Uh, the 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 intentions we have and who and sometimes who holds the hammer, of course. Um, and uh, for, for, for us, it's, it's our, our, our vision. It, it needs to be that we are going to do something good with this, with this uh, technology, doing something good for the planet and for the people and, and, uh, and, and mobilize for, for doing that. That's, that's uh, we, we cannot dis, disregard technology. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. So a question has just come in actually. Uh, how do you see the increasing role of state-owned enterprise investing in the private sector, including overseas? For example, Chinese SOEs investing overseas in private companies. Do you see them having – can they still be – okay, the language is a little bit right? – do you see them as having someday privatized or can they still be relevant? So I guess the question is around state – investment in the private sector. Any, any views well, on that from the group? I, I think, uh, like, you know, the, the highest risk ones are probably good uh, for to be, like, state invested, uh, like basic research, I think, if that, that is the question. Um, so I think, you know, providing tools to build with and then opening them up very, very quickly, because I do agree with what Elizabeth says in, in and, you know, the, the power of open source and, and, and when you link that back to, um, you know, the public good, like we all decide what the public good is. Not one person decides what the public good is. And I think that's very, very important in, in that whole discussion is that we involve everyone in that conversation. And as you have, you know, maybe different views of what public good is in different parts of the world, um, you know, it, it's very important that we keep opening up those, those, those technologies and, you know, keep giving people the opportunities within certain boundaries to, to do that good. Yeah. Well, going back to what Tom said before, uh, doing uh, government um, investments in, in ground research like ARPANET, uh, et cetera, that is, of course, uh, the role of the, of the politicians. But Coming from uh, uh, from Sweden, uh, an earlier very social democratic country, we have a big, long history of, of state uh, investments, and the the result of that has not been very positive. The roy of it, uh, so to speak, uh, 
for n neither neither from an economic or, or public good uh, perspective. So I think there's a, a big divide here in, in uh, who should invest in what. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, seeing that there are no other questions, I want to thank each of you for participating today. I think it was a very lively and good discussion. I hope uh, the people who joined found it interesting. And uh, I hope that all of us can stay in touch. And, uh, you know, thank you for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank inspiring you. by everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.